welcome warmly Elena Matrosa. She's a full professor of education at the Department of Foreign Languages and Literature uh, and Modern Culture in, uh, in the, uh, at the University of Turin and perhaps well known, the chief editor of Paidotica, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Italian uh, book series and a journal and it's now, nowadays it's in an open access format. Yes. So perhaps you can find it in the internet and you can download. It's very interesting. So um, her research fields are, of course, uh, theories and philosophies of education, phenomenological and existential approaches, as well as de deconstruction in uh, education, theoretical and methodological research, uh, of literature in education and um, investigations and um, in, uh, methodological implications of autobiographical writing. So I warmly welcome uh, Elena and perhaps you, you will stand, you want to stand? stand? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Malte, for your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. We will talk about musical listening between uh, everyday reality and sensitive experience on aesthetic education of young people. The proposition I wish to bring to your attention seeks to answer to two interrelated questions. The first, is there an immaterial reality in the everyday lives of young people that can be read within the framework of aesthetic experience of a phenomenological kind? And the second, what are the pedagogical implications we can draw from it, both in terms of theoretical reflection and educational practices? My speech is composed in three parts. Uh, the first part is dedicated to the introduction of the topic with focus on the listening to music in young people through a philosophical and a sociological perspective, different conception of the formation of trust, and the personal view of reality will thus emerge. The second part is dedicated to the verification of the possible intertwining of these interpretative differences in the direction of a more marked theoretical pedagogical analysis of the topic. This analysis will call into question the modes of musical fruition and the meaning of listening from a phenomenological perspective of the formation of the subjective personality. The third part will be devoted to the resumption of the areas of formal and informal education in which the instance of signification can be suggested as a practice attentive to different aspects of the versions of reality involved. This idea will be supported by an example of an education proposal already implemented with foreign language teachers and secondary school students in Turin. So the first part. The time of the pandemic has brought back to center stage the rethinking of some of the key categories of doing education and being information that invest the daily experience of young people. What is certain in the field is the change that the pandemic itself seems to have permanently produced. At the same time, it is precisely the enforced absence of embodied relationship and the unexpected disruption of established habits that has allowed the valorization of formal experience that have always been part of young people's everyday life, thus updating their meaning. One of these experiences is for sure that of listening to music, most commonly perceived as an important resource to escape from harsh reality, as a form of leisure, fashion, pure entertainment. In opposition to the concrete reality 
made of duties and commitments, music often constitutes, in the common perception, the intimate space of a dreamed or imagined reality. In short, it consists um, uh, in the creation of a parallel reality, personal and inaccessible to others, even when the musical experience is shared. It is equally true, however, that listening is in many cases also an orientator of self-understanding and perception of reality, in a way that differs from the objective, realistic maybe, description of the world. In this second case, music becomes a space for the construction of sensitive imagery and a space for the reading of contingent reality that can rarely be equaled in terms of perceptive immediacy and power of involvement. So that we can say that musical listening draws on the vast field of everyday experience that innervate the lives of young people, giving them color and depth, and that concern informal education. But the role of education in making music is something far more meaningful than either a leisure experience as an end in itself, or a merely cognitive, technical, or intellectual experience, which would end up stripping it of its expressive possibilities. Let us make clear from the outset that the musical sphere we are talking about here is that of popular music, and in particular its rock variants, in the awareness that this field is not only the one of reference of a large part of young people, through not necessarily of adolescents, but is also the one of greatest pedagogical interest due to the plurality of its contents and the aesthetic intensity it offers. And it is, uh, it is this uh, same field that is studied by philosophers and sociologists of music in relation to youth. Such a musical context is then useful in avoiding excessive generalization, focusing attention, but not judgment, on a specific type of relationship between subjective interiority and experience of the world that finds the fundamental motive of listening specifically in the search for meaning. Here, reality is not evaded in the dimension of a superfluous pleasure but is interpreted with aesthetic imaginative tools. And I will develop this aspect in part two. Youth music, in fact, has proved to be a powerful instrument for social homolog homologation of conditioning trust and perception of self and the world. Especially in the everyday experience, in terms of frequency and mode of consumption, contamination with the visual and its icons, the aesthetics assume the connotation that are increasingly attentive to the process of decoding by the audience. In particular, in the analysis of the philosopher and sociologist of education, Pierre Bourdieu, test and musical test in particular, is the result of social conditioning that silently but inexorably dictates the semantics of belonging and subjective aspirations. Within this framework, cultures that define as legitimate belonging from milieu and school characterize the dynamics of social distinction in a deterministic way leaving very limited margins for a conception of the aesthetic as a place for free subjective expressiveness. The close relationship between task formation, social aspects, and pedagogical practices 
is guided in Bourdieu's work by the study of social reproduction and the formulation of the idea of habitus. In the light of these two constructs, pedagogical work develops through a process of mental, I quote, inculcation that becomes moral internalization. In particular, in the study of distinction, 1979, music and painting are at the center um, of the social analysis of tasks. And in this work, Bourdieu points out that in the education system, the space for artistic education is quite clearly almost non-existent. So that the non-school cultural capital, I quote, represents the guaranteed result of the cumulative effects of the cultural transmission ensured by the family and the cultural transmission ensured by the school in the form of a disinterested propensity to accumulate experiences and knowledge. So what is real, in Bourdieu's perspective, is a veritable manipulation of test that identifies as an internalized reference the self-representation conveyed by the educational system through practices that it does not itself exercise directly, but which it inculcates indirectly and persuasively with respect to quality attributes implicitly associated with the image of desiderable social position, which Bourdieu calls um, secondary habitus. In this way, however, the school would not only not challenge the bourgeois habitus, that is the main habitus vehicle by school, but would, on the contrary, have a conforming function precisely on the perception of reality conveyed by music. The picture outlined by Bourdieu amplifies the split between high culture and low culture, a separation which today, in everyday youth life, is much more fluid and which responds to a panorama of fruitions incapable of distinguishing tests and social classes with the same clarity. The perspective of the socio uh, sociologist of music, Simon Frith, is different. In Frith's opinion, popular music does not pander to common feeling, but constructs it. Um, the question we should be asking is not what does popular music reveal about the people, but how does it construct them? Frith argues that it is production itself that establishes the forms of reception, structuring it around the most common emotion, love above all, with important variant, variation on sex, of course, and amplifying them in the widest range of tonalities. Frith works revolves around the production people, rather than the receptive one that was one of Bourdieu, considering that any resistance or signification attributable by the consumer to the musical product is only possible on the condition that the consumer is fully aware of the production process. Far from any pure or purifying artistic destination, the pop music experience invests not a particular age of life, but the whole existence, working indeed on the, uh, in terms of a continuous identity and autobiographical narrative. As far as the pedagogical aspects are concerned, Bourdieu's and Fries' position are relevant to understanding how the processes of adhesion and differentiation can characterize subjectivation through musical listening need in order to be formative. A more supervised awareness of the mechanism of uh, regulation 
of modeling. Not infre infrequently, in fact, musical genres are born and have intentionally developed on social parameters, climbing members, membership of urban and suburban peripheries, proletarian or subproletarian, migrants or blacks, virilist or feminist or queer, avant-garde or nihilist, etc. For this reason, however, pedagogically taking into account also the processes of adherence to a model of group inclusion and extinction um, and of embodying a certain self-representation helps to distinguish the social reproduction function of music from its aesthetic experience, which are two different levels. So, so we now are shifting by the level of social reality to the level of aesthetic experience, aesthetic reality. Thinking of, uh, thinking of music as an aesthetic experience means shifting attention to the role of an education and training then, rather than orienting tasks and canonizing aesthetic experience, of, offer the critical interpretative tools that teach individual needs in order to understand, choose, and act. The French philosopher, in open opposition to Bourdieu's determinism, Michel de Certeau, argues that the real space of signification is located in invention of which unknown constitutes the cleft of entry and exit rather than, the being, rather than being the reason of a passive homologation. So this is a completely different position from that of Bourdieu, and this position is located on aesthetic experience. Um, he means that what the subject does unconsciously is the starting point of a creation of the invention through which he transforms what is not predictable and given into narration, elaboration, action. Emblematically, if the substitution of rea reality with its representational fiction is what the media and the market work on, the public does not assume their proposal unconditionally but observes and reinterprets the relationship between reality and fiction in a dis discursiveness of its own. It is from this interpretative genesis that begin, begins the invention of new realities, but also of or, or better, new narration of realities, uh, but also of new instrument of action which modify the structure and objective of the original message. The level of unspoken discursiveness that runs through experience and existence itself, constructing the subjective personality, remains elusive and active. According to this approach, reality never corresponds to the confrontation of a fact endowed with an ambiguous meaning but is the result of a mixture of factors that redefine themselves dynamically in the subject-object relationship. So, here the focal point uh, to go to the second part, because in the phenomenological perspective, um, the phenomenological perspective lends itself in another pivot, to pivoting on perceptual experience uh, as a place of the sensible that precedes the rational construction of knowledge, starting from the need to describe the relationship between subject and world in an anti-dogmatic manner. The fundamental core of the discourse in this case shifts from the reaction to an aesthetic request more or less foreseen and predictable to the link between perception and knowledge. We know that according to Husserl, 
what is really given in perception is self-evident only as a relation of materiality and reflexivity, such as co-presence. Knowledge, then, begins to be constituted not in the rational exercise, not in the erlebnis, and not even in the perception codified as such, we codify as such this after the experience, but before that in the embodied experience of the original interrelationship in which subject and object realize each other, before the distinction between perception, th thought, and experience is brought into focus. Indeed, for Merleau-Ponty, the poetic encounter between subject and sounds is given in terms of reciprocity. It is in the encounter itself, realized pre-productively, that subjectivity and music are constituted in a mode of relation that focuses on the quality of the phenomenological datum and its constitutive giving of itself as a plexus of empirical transcendental relation. In his fundamental investigation of the untaught in Husserl, Merleau-Ponty identifies living as a mode of knowing that includes both experiencing and experience it. Living for Merleau-Ponty is given by the clarity of the experience of feeling whereby, she sta uh, he stated, the inner and the outer are inseparable. The world is all within and I am all without. So it follows the knowledge begins to be constituted by the perceptual and therefore embodied experience of the original interrelationship in which subjects and sound, while existing in their mutual independence are only reciprocally realized. It's not a matter of existence, it's a matter of realization. This is not so set aesthetic experience against rational experience, but to conceive of aesthetic experience as that which anticipates rational experience. The synthesis of perce perceptual and ideational dimension is crucial because, because it makes the sensory experience a porous one, the permeability of which, however, must be shown in order uh, for it to be grasped as an opportunity of formation. The constant exchange, perceptive and then symbolic, between listening and music either remains a mute experience of emotional correspondence or emerges in its recognized transformative potential. So that thought during listening is never the exclusive product of the mind of the listener, but of the encounter between living and, the, and experienced between what is happening to the images and sensation that listening produces and what made the encounter between subject and sound possible. So much so that the French philosopher states to think, this is so important in my opinion, to think is not to possess objects of thought. It is to circumscribe by means of these a field to be thought, which therefore we do not yet think. In the encounter with music, the subject is constituted and constitutes. Music as co-participation generates images and meanings which are strongly rooted through the intensity of the pathic feeling in the form that the subject takes takes on, sorry, as its own. The subject as resonant cavity, says Merleau-Ponty, disseminates 
its everyday life with musicality constituting images and meaning anchored in sound. This is why the poeticity of the encounter, the doing something of listening, guaranteed only by the reciprocity of experience, uh, can be enhanced by education. The creation of realities that are neither subjective nor objective, but relational. This reality can be enlightened and amplified when the subject becomes fully aware of the original interrelationship, and this is the aim of education in this case. So we can imagine the encounter, the poetic encounter, as a flow between the inner and the outer. Mm. Sound and lyrics, sorry. Mm. Sound and lyrics evoke memories and arouse images. Uh, soundscapes become mental representation in the listener. Such creative exercises arise from ex existential experience, from a certain relational or emotional situation, as well as from a social reality, from a news story or an ideological construct, from an event or a gym, from a literary text, for example, or another sensitive experience. For this reason, the resonant and imaginative variants in the listener can be very many and very different. In the light of the phenomenological awareness of the original reciprocal co-belonging of subject and object, it is not any longer a certain quality inherent to the cultural object, music or lyrics, that makes the difference, but the description of the cultural object the narratability that combines the discovery of its connotation. These ways of work, its ways of working, its horizons. Here education, formal or informal, it's not important, governs the processes that connect the co-belonging and knowledge. But the full realization of this possibility implies explicit attention Indeed, reflexivity on aesthetic experience allow a worldview to take shape. And this is a need particularly felt in young. Although such shaping is neither absolute or definitive, it is nevertheless ordered according to those resonant perceptual elements that color reality in a certain way. In this case, the subject achieves instantaneously stated Merleau-Ponty, a rich, instantaneously, a richer meaning that what previously only indicated. We can therefore state that the difference between formation and conformism is distinguished neither by the genre of music nor by musical quality, nor by social distinction, but by awareness. In awareness, it is possible to amplify the forms of satisfaction in listening, to recognize one's own propensities for participatory listening oriented by musical genres, to recognize in generational attitude or stylistic naivety the reasons for one's own fondness and disciplining, and to choose a direction that acts on such self-understanding. So this means inventing, creating new realities. Now the example, part three. In educational practices, the instance of signification can be suggested for constructing one's personality, attentive to the different versions of reality involved that we have already seen. If we assume with Merleau-Ponty that perception circumscribe a field of thinking, then education can intervene in this field, offering perceptive and cognitive opportunities that are alternatives 
to the already known, that provide new listening, or at least a new way of listening. Moreover, the relationship between music and literature, philosophy, theater, civic engagement, are neither far nor trivial, and by extension also the possibility of intertextual analysis and connection between the words proposed in the text and the real world. It deals with, it, it deals with the possibility of reading music as a cultural expression of an era, an atmosphere, a civil civilization, a utopian tension through plural conception and forms of ex existence. The example I'm going to propose was tested as part of a training meeting held in the Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures and Modern Culture in November 2029, 21, sorry. <laughs> the meeting was open to foreign language and civilization teacher at the fourth and fifth last two years in Italy of secondary school classes. A total of six classes from different school contexts participated with their teachers, totaling about 140 people. In no way was the meeting presented as a form of experimentation. It was a matter of suggesting to both teachers and students a series of tools of reflection capable of making explicit the relationship between cultural content, everyday light, and the formation of the self. This in the conviction that showing that often latent entwining of contingent reality, desired reality, and interpreted reality is one of the school's most important educational tasks. The activity took place in collaboration between myself and my colleague Luca Bellone, who teaches Italian linguistics and deals with music-mediated youth language. Um, in particular, the pedagogical commitment to uh, sifting, sifting the meaning of reality with culturally aware languages and perspectives combined with the search for listener participation and also reflected in the attention devoted to literature and philosophy as artistic cultural sources of a connection between, connection between life and representation and between divergent versions of reality. The activity held last year the educational proposal focused on a number of issues related to the construction of identity. Uh, sorry, no? Okay. Um, the importance of the family milieu, information of test, the power of the record market in terms of widespread fruition, and the construction of models also, the weight of the dynamics of recognition in peer group. Furthermore, I wanted to open a window on the world of education in its breadth, showing that everyone is educated not only by formal contexts such as school and family, but also by informal ones which are not perceived as educational but by younger students simply because their transformative, transformative action remains implicit and precisely for this reason is often more effective. The intertextual content aspects, on the other hand, were introduced by a quick overview, purely illustrative, of the recurrence of literature and philosophical sources of inspiration in many songs of different genres, different genres, different eras. Behind the singer song, or songwriter genre, where the, uh, the reference to literature and art in general is more immediate, the proposed examples span eras and styles more or less familiar to the interlocutors. So, 
as we can say, the doors the end of the night is inspired by Celine's novel, Jefferson Airplane by Lewis Carroll novel, Tire Straits by Shakespeare, The Cure by Albert Camus, by Penelope Former, Bastille by Coleridge. Not to mention the proliferation of songs inspired by dystopian literature now back in the public eye, such as Aldous Huxley for the very name of the doors, Always Huxley, songs by Iron Maiden and Stro Strokes, so very, very different genres of music, George Orwell by David Bowie, Eurythmics, and recently by Muse. So with these examples, the idea that emerges is that songs which create atmospheres return to return the scenarios of cultural knowledge to a less dusty perception, and above all, refer more immediately to the correspondence between personal text and textual context. In the cases listened, are in the cases listed, uh, and in many others, the idea that the forms of knowledge offered by culture are useful tools to, for mm, deciphering reality, that takes shape and strength thanks to the particular form of sensitive relationship established by in listening. In this sense, the persuasiveness of music grabs the listener attention because it is a reflexive offering. Knowing that words are, are open to subjective reading as the effects not only of exercises were known thinking, but also of considering one's own reality as common and shareable with others. Knowing then that the songs represent current realities or imaginary realities to suggest reflexivity through aesthetic experience places that experience itself outside the circuit of passive enjoyment. So the protests can be most diverse, from news events to dreams, from poetic to linguistic expressive research, from typically philosophical themes, death, the relationship between reality and truth, otherness to the small connected to the labors of everyday life, loneliness and intersubjective relations, conflicts and their perspectives, until an artistic subjectivity emerges from the combination of music and lyrics, which are thought in the process of becoming can foster in the listener the opening of imaginary spaces a sort of relays race, therefore, which allows the listener to participate and which then leaves open the individual questioning of one's own affection, vision of reality, desire and aspiration of way of being in relation to others. Um, I... I uh, go to the participant, two insights. I propose two insights in particular. Um, one is related to British culture and, sorry, and the other is related to Italian, was related to Italian culture with a reference to Dante because as you know we have had an important anniversary last year on Dante but uh, I will refer to the British culture. I only say that the Dante reference was Pyramid Song by Radiohead. And the most impressive thing in this encounter with <laughs> young students um, that were about 16 years old is that they perfectly, perfectly know Radiohead. It, it was a surprise for me. And <laughs> the... Uh, purpose related to British culture was Kate Bush Wuthering Nights, inspired by Emily Bronte's novel, of course, 
the song is from uh, 1978. Mm, uh, the novel was familiar to a high school student of that age, uh, but known, known of the young audience knew Kate Bush. And it will be different now after the comeback success brought about sig significantly <laughs> by the use of her song Running Up the Hill in the series Net Netflix series Stranger Things. So now all the world knows um, Kate Bush. But what is interesting in showing the video of the British artist was to emphasize uh, the multiple nature of her performance, which is very simple, even stark from the stage front point of view, but uh, she has uh, studied mime and dance with Lindsay Camp and uh, is being gifted with her remarkable vocal skills. And so she char uh, characterizes her music by accentuating the expressive potential of the contact with her body. So it was possible, even if none of the young audience knew her, it was possible to immerse oneself in the sensitive experience generated by the encounter what a, uh, with an unknown music. The lyrics of the songs of the song evoke some salient passages of the tormented and tragic love between Heathcliff and Catherine, of course, making one feel the drama of the impossibility, the strains of hatred, and the fear of death. All feelings and emotions that commonly recur in the existential experiences of the audience. So, in conclusion, the placement of musical experience within the overall spectrum of the aesthetic signifier opens up spaces of formative analysis in which the processes of subjectivation and subjection by insisting on the lived experience of everyday life allow the coming into light of what is implicit in formal education. Especially, uh, especially in youth when music is still of considerable importance. Music experience can become an opportunity to elaborate reality by experiencing one's own poetic singularity, reinterpreting individual musical affection in order of a more conscious and fuller personal awareness, which goes beyond what Echo called its gastronomic usability. And we might say here also beyond representations of reality, all enclosed in the seduction of, as in, of an impossible enchantment to privilege instead the relationship between different words, readings and experiences. Thank you.